Part 1. You are going to hear a conversation which happened in a travel agency. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we will play the recording. Listen to the tape and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi. I would like to make a reservation for a round-trip plane ticket from London to New York. Welcome to the Student Travel Agency. London to New York. Let me see if we have any student specials for that flight. Yes, we do, in fact. What days would you like to fly? I am looking for a flight around the 10th of October or so. And how about your return date? Ideally, the 31st of October. Let me check our computers to see if these dates are available. Are you looking for economy class or first class? Economy class will be just fine. We have an open flight on the 10th, but for your returning flight, the 31st of October is already fully booked. If you want to upgrade to first class, there are openings for the 31st. Just a few seats left, though. How much do I have to add for first class? First class will be around 20 to 25 percent more. Well, that is not worth it. I would rather just fly on another day. Do I have any other options? There are open seats back to London on the 1st of November. There are openings for first class that day, too. No, I won't be able to do that because I have to work. Is there anything before the 31st? Maybe the 30th or 29th? Let me check. You can fly on the 29th, but not the 30th. Hmm, the 29th is a little bit early. Is there any way I can be on a waiting list of some sort? Of course, but you should still confirm a return date just to be safe. OK. How about if I book a return date on the 29th? and add my name to the waiting list for the 31st. Can I do that? Sure, I can do that for you. Do you also want to add your name on the waiting list for the 30th also? I would recommend this in the scenario that you do not get the flight for the 31st. That is a good idea. How much will the round trip cost? I will calculate your price for you. Your total will be £565, not including tax. Now look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 6 to 10. That's not too bad. Is there any discount for students? That is already including the discount. Without the discount, the price is easily over £600. OK, that sounds good then. Please put me down for those dates. I will need your information. Name and student identification number, please. Kenneth Connolly. Student ID 92. One, two, three, zero, two, zero. Your phone number, please. Eight, seven, zero, five, two, one, zero, nine. Please tell me your mailing address. Three, five, four, Westchester Drive, London. Thank you very much, sir. How would you like to pay for the ticket? I think I will pay in cash. Well, you don't need to pay right now, just when you come to pick up the tickets. You will need to pick up the tickets at least two weeks before departure. That is no problem. One quick question. What happens if for some reason I need to cancel my trip? The student discount tickets are unfortunately non-refundable. However, if your cancellation is before 24 hours of takeoff time, then you can reschedule your flight for another day. 
If the cancellation is within 24 hours, then you forfeit your ticket. I understand. Well, thank you very much. I will see you next week. See you then. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a library assistant talking about the library she works in. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Hi, can I help you? Um, yes. I wanted to join the library. OK. First of all, let me show you around the library and explain a few things for you. OK. Now we're here at the main entrance. You can see the reception, which is where you bring back and take out books. And also, we can order books and answer your questions there. Mm -hmm. Next to the reception, where you can see those old desks, is where we keep the magazines, because you can sit down and read there. They're divided into sections for sciences, geography, arts, etc. Uh, then, at the back of the library, you can see the section for old books. And next to that is where the books proper start. That used to be the science section. But now, on those shelves, you'll find the art section. We had a big reorganisation in the summer, which I think has made it clearer. Oh. <laughs> the numbering is standard, so you should be able to find what you want quite easily. However, if you can't find something, it probably means it's been borrowed. OK, then in the corner, next to the reference section, is where we thought it was quietest and away from the phones and printers and things. So we've put the study desks there. They all have computer access if you need it for your laptop. No. We do ask that you don't just read magazines there, though. OK, uh, then there's the reference section where you can look up the files. Then, as we come back to the main entrance, is the next section, where we used to have the languages. It got very busy and noisy, so when we moved everything round, we decided to put the law books here. Also, because it's a smaller section, it fits quite well here. Ah. OK then, we're back at the main entrance. Over there, by reception, there's a door that goes to the extension. And we have further sections, such as languages and study desks through there. So you could have a look round when we've finished. Then, just between reception and the door here, is where we decided to put the computers. But the computer magazines are in the magazine section, as we found too many went missing here. Oh. <laughs> OK, is that everything? You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20.
That's great, thanks. Can you just tell me a bit about borrowing and the rules and whatever? Of course. Over the last two months, we've been introducing a new system for this, and you can now take books out for six weeks. That's generally enough for most people. We usually get books back within 30 days. Of course, you may decide to renew the period. You used to have to come in to get the book stamped because we don't like doing it over the phone as there's no record of it. But now you can do all that via email. Oh. If you do forget to renew, then we do make a charge, I'm afraid. That helps our costs, of course, but we do insist on it. The good news is that there is only one charge. I know some libraries charge one pound for one week and then it goes up with each week it's late. We ask for one pound fifty, as we think that's high enough to stop people being overdue. <laughs> The other thing you may want to know is what you do about books that are not on the shelves. We do have a system for reserving them. All you have to do is fill in a yellow form behind those blue ones on the desk uh -huh. and give it to someone at reception. We'll let you know when it comes in. Also, sometimes you will need a journal article that we don't have but can get from other libraries. So we offer an ordering service if you need it. Now, if you'd like to fill in this form here... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a conversation between two students, David and Claire. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, David. How are you going with your history studies? Very well. I've actually finished it. That's great! What era did you write on? I researched Roman London, something I never thought I'd be interested in. That sounds interesting. I wanted to tie it into the work I've been doing on engineering, and I found it fascinating <laughs> and learned many things along the way. Such as? Well, although there were prehistoric settlements throughout the vast area now called London, Strangely enough, no evidence has yet been found for any such community at the northern end of London Bridge, where the present city grew up. The origins of London lie in Roman times, right? Right. When the Romans invaded Britain in 43 AD, they moved north from the Kentish coast and traversed the Thames in the London region, clashing with the local tribesmen just to the north. It has been suggested that the soldiers crossed the river at Lambeth, but it was further downstream that they built a permanent wooden bridge, just east of the present London Bridge, in more settled times some seven years later. As a focal point of the Roman road system, it was the bridge which attracted settlers and led to London's inevitable growth. So London Bridge has been there for hundreds of years? Yes, and though the regularity of London's original street grid may indicate that the initial inhabitants were the military, trade and commerce soon followed. The London Thames was deep and still within the tidal zone, an ideal place for the berthing of ships. What other industry did they have? Well, as the area was also well-drained and low-lying, it was geologically suitable for brick-making, there was soon a flourishing city called Londinium in the area where the monument now stands. Londinium? 
That's Latin. That's what I thought too, but the name itself is Celtic, not Latin, and may originally have referred merely to a previous farmstead on the site. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Wasn't London burned to the ground at some stage? It happened in A.D. sixty, by the forces of Queen Boudicca of the Iceni tribe from modern Norfolk, when she led a major revolt against Roman rule. The governor, Suetonius Paulinus, who was busy exterminating the Druids in North Wales. Marched his troops south in an attempt to save London, but seeing the size of Boudicca's approaching army, decided he could not mount an adequate defence and evacuated the city instead. Not everyone managed to escape, though, and many were massacred. What about the beautiful old architecture? Did you research that too? I sure did. The major symbol of Roman rule was the Temple of the Imperial Cult. Emperor worship was administered by the provincial council, whose headquarters appear to have been in London by A.D. 100. A member of its staff, named Anencletus, buried his wife on Ludgate Hill around this time. Pagan worship flourished within the cosmopolitan city. A temple to the mysterious eastern god Mithras was found at Bucklersbury House and is displayed nearby. I quite like Saint Paul's. Traditionally, Saint Paul's Cathedral stands on the site of a temple of Diana. Other significant buildings also began to appear in the late first century, at a time when the city was expanding rapidly. The Forum, a marketplace and basilica which housed the law courts complex at Leadenhall Market, was erected and then quickly replanned. As the largest such complex north of the Alps, the Forum was much bigger than today's Trafalgar Square. Who was in charge of all the town planning at the time? Procurator Agricola. He encouraged the use of bathhouses, and had a grand public suite made, which is now being excavated in Upper Thames Street. They were as much a social venue as a place to bathe. There was a smaller version at Cheapside. And in later centuries, private bathhouses were also built. Another popular attraction was the wooden amphitheatre, erected on the northwestern outskirts of the city. It's possible that gladiatorial shows were put on here, though lesser public sports like bear baiting may have been more regular. I thought that happened mainly in the Colosseum in Rome. But I guess London being settled by the Romans explains their lust for blood. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. In this section, you'll hear an interview on IQ tests. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Mrs. Kellerman, a specialist in child psychology, is interviewed by Bridget. Mrs. Kellerman, why is it that some children perform much better than others at school? Obviously, it can't be denied that certain children are brighter than others, but it's not as simple as that. A lot of emphasis is placed on intelligence measured by tests, so-called IQ tests, which only measure certain types of intelligence, such as basically linguistic and numerical skills, or reading and mathematics to put it plainly, which is unfortunate because some children are bound to suffer. A good example was a friend of mine's son who was kept out of the top class at school because of his average IQ. That's around 100. His father, though he had no idea his son was going to be an architect, always said he was a clever child. Apparently, he was able to picture things in his mind and draw accurately at a very early age. The point is that his university life might not have been so difficult if his ability had been recognised sooner. What you're saying, then, is that some children have abilities that are not easy to measure, that aren't appreciated by many schools. Precisely. And if these schools are not spotted sufficiently early, they cannot be developed. That's why, in my view, there are so many unhappy adults in the world. They are not doing the things they are best at. What are those other kinds of intelligence? How can we recognise them in our children? Well, take musical talent. Many children never get the chance to learn to play an instrument, but while they might not become great artists or composers, they may get a lot of pleasure and satisfaction. Musically gifted children are fascinated by all kinds of sounds, car horns, animal noises, and so on, and they can easily recognise tunes and sing them in key. How can a parent encourage them? Sing to them and teach them new songs. Buy a piano or even a cheap instrument such as a recorder. If you can afford it, send them to music lessons as soon as possible. Play recordings of different instruments to them. What about a child who is good at sport? Could that be described as a form of intelligence? Most certainly. We psychologists call it motor or bodily intelligence. These children move gracefully and handle objects skillfully. A child who finds it easy to take things apart and use various tools may well become an engineer with the right encouragement. We should give them models to make and take them to science museums. However, unless these children are also good with words and numbers, they will probably not do well in school examinations. Is there anything a parent can do to help in this case? Yes, it may be worth spending money on private lessons, but, you know, hardly anyone is good at everything. In my opinion, a child should be judged on his individual talents. After all, being happy in life is putting your skills to good use, no matter what they are. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.